Pop Quiz. What's the best way to source new talent for every one of your tough hiring initiatives? A. Post your jobs on job boards and wait for the right candidates to see your jobs and apply. B. Pay top dollar to scour the same LinkedIn professionals you've contacted over and over for similar roles in the past. Or C. Start sourcing from a talent pool of 1.15 billion highly engaged social media and mobile users across industries, skill sets, and locations with Facebook? Well, with users spending one in every seven minutes online on Facebook, everyone you need is already there, publicly sharing information about their professional lives, including where they went to school, where they work, which of your employees they know, and what skills they've mastered. Whether you're looking for someone to drive a truck, staff your restaurant, take care of patients, or build your next software product, they're all there. Just one Facebook search and message away. And now you can use Workforce Graph Search Recruiter Solution to automate and simplify your sourcing. With one click, your recruiters can identify and message talent on Facebook who match their jobs for as little as $1. That's 10% of the cost of LinkedIn Recruiter. Facebook's revolutionary graph search shows you the most relevant people related to a search through Facebook's massive database. Now Workforce Graph Search Recruiter makes sourcing simple. We import the jobs from your ATS, search for the candidates who fit your job descriptions, and even give your team a way to track who applies. All you have to do is click a button to discover and contact local talent. Talent connected to your employees, talent who likes your company, talent who works in your industry, and more. It's time to make the smart choice. Start sourcing on Facebook with Graph Search Recruiter from Work4 Today. Work4, the number one Facebook recruiting solution. Great, thank you very much, Matt. I'm excited to be here. Um, we've done a few of these webinars, um, some around social, some around mobile. Um, we're going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, we've invited uh, Lars Schmidt to join us, so we're going to be kind of co-presenting, if you will. Um, and then the idea is to go a little bit deeper than we have in the past around social recruiting. Um, I think it's something that's now an accepted practice, and we want to say, okay, if you've done it for a year, for six months, for two years, what does it yield you? What does it get you? Get a little bit more deeper around the strategy, and um, so I'm going to go over kind of a, a an overview of social as it relates to recruiting and the best practices, and then we're going to pass it over to Lars, who's got experience in some of his roles uh, as a talent director uh, at various uh, enterprises that he's worked at and now he's uh, obviously his co-owner um, if you will in the Amplified Talent, so the sole proprietor of Amplified Talent. So we're happy to have Lars here and we're happy to cover this topic today. Again, if you want to tweet, uh, you like something you hear, please share it. Um, we have the work for webinar hashtag at work for labs is um, our at symbol if you will. So we're going to cover trends. Um, and <laughs> I love this slide because, you know, how far can you take Legos, right? Can you make Lego fashion? Can you make Lego movies? You know, is it a trend or is it something that's going to stick around for a while? So while we get into this, um, I think we're going to identify a trend, identify a strategy that seems to be sticking and then producing candidates. Um, a lot of the effort that we've seen employers, you know, put forth and, you know, if you have play money, you can try something, trial and error, if you will, um, is yielding some of the successes. So I don't want to ignore um, what is a trend, but we should also talk about, okay, what's not, you know, something that should be pursued or invested in more heavily um, as you go about finding the better avenues for talent pool creation, for pipeline creation, and to satisfy the, the demanding hiring managers and the business owners that you all support in the recruiting function. So trend number one is social recruiting, it, it's more powerful than ever. So this is, um, you know, some pretty impressive statistics. 42% um, say that a candidate quality can be improved through social recruiting, and 31% saw an increase in employer referrals. So what, what does that mean? 42% That's a nice number. What that means is the candidates that you're getting, because there's some kind of social connection between either the recruiter or the employee and that person who's familiar with the company, people are doing more research. They're not just applying to jobs to just get a job. I think people are saying, hey, if I'm going to make my work life better, I'm going to do some research. I'm going to go to some sites that have information about the company that I'm interested in. I'm going to go look at who is an employer in my geographic area. And then also I'm going to talk to people who are happy at their job and say, hey, why is the culture better there than where I'm at? Or, you know, do you have real true leaders working for the company versus people that are just set there to manage and, and to do, you know, peer reviews? It takes 20% less time to hire 
which is still an incredible metric when you think about the process of, of putting somebody through the, the talent acquisition pipeline and, and getting somebody in the, in the seat to fill the position. And then 73% hired successfully using social media. So that's three-fourths. So three out of four people are successfully using social media. You have a candidate quality improvement metric that's real. You have an increase in referrals, which is still, for most companies, the number one source. And then it takes less time. So those are pretty powerful stats. So will this continue to thrive is the question. And you have to look at the big three. So you have um, Americans spending an average of 37 minutes daily on social media. That is huge. That is a massive amount of time. And whether it's waiting in a line um, you know, and, and having, having idle time and pulling up your email or your Facebook chat or even you know, reading your Twitter feed or in some cases you know, there's some regular users of LinkedIn, these are the active numbers. It, this just tells you that if there's 1.2 billion active users on Facebook, then yeah, so the, the 37 minutes is, is pretty real. And it's a pretty incredible metric. And the reach and the use of social media, no matter what demographic, age, et cetera, you are, is, uh, will continue to thrive. So I think it's going to be, continue to be a great place to spend your energy and spend your money. So that's trend one, social recruiting. Seems to be sticking. Trend two is mobile. In our view, and I've been working for Labs almost two years now, social kind of equals mobile. Um, you know, LinkedIn has come up with a fantastic application. Facebook continues to improve their application. Twitter, I don't know if I've ever been on the Twitter website other than to change my settings because everything I do is mobile. There's been reports that up to 70% of the people are on you know, mobile devices when they're on their social networks. We know for sure Facebook is 55%. We know that for sure LinkedIn is about 23 to 24%. And we know Twitter is a little higher. So 40% of the mobile users would go to a competitor if the website's not mobily optimized. This is from a report from the search agents. And this year, mobile's protected to overtake desktop. So mobile means a smartphone or a tablet. And it simply means reaching people um, where they are when they're ready. And this could be the same during the last you know, holiday season we saw with you know, Amazon and the mobile websites and all the internet shopping that happened. And this now means job content, you know, public brand impression of, of an employment brand, et cetera. And as you build, let's say, a LinkedIn page or a Facebook company page or even a Facebook career page or, or a Twitter handle specifically for careers, you're seeing that the content that's being read and shared and basically, you know, proliferating throughout the social networks is happening on a mobile device. It's getting easier. It's getting um, more accepted and you're going to miss the boat if you don't go mobile. So social and mobile are kind of tied together and I think job searching today is really it's a multi-screen reality. It could be that I don't want to go through your screening questions on my smartphone and I would save my email and I'd go back to the link you email me and say hey I'll, I'll fill out those questions later. It could be I'm on my, um, specifically my uh, tablet because it's a little bigger screen, I can see more stuff. But if I browse jobs at work and I save a jobs for later, I get alerted on my mobile device. I'm researching companies during my commute on the train or wherever I am. And you know, I might just finish the, the process on my desktop at home because it feels more secure to me. But the reality is it's not just going to happen with one person on one device every single time you get a candidate or, or you get a pipeline of people. Um, I'm going to stop there, Lars, if you want to chime in a little bit about social and mobile being kind of tied at the hip and, and what you've seen before I go into kind of the next trend about Facebook, if you want to comment real quick. Yeah, you know, I think you led with the two right trends. Um, you know, social recruiting, I think these days, probably beyond a trend phase. I think most corporate recruiting organizations understand that, you know, they need to have a presence on social both to extend their employer brand you know, and, and kind of position themselves as an employer of choice within different communities where they recruit. But the mobile piece is also really important. And I'll, I'll shed a little more light on this when we get into the case study on NPR. But, you know, we certainly noticed that at NPR, because we leverage social so heavily as a method to share our jobs um, and promote culture and, and promote our, our employer brand, but specifically also to share jobs, we found that a lot of our traffic was actually coming in through mobile devices. And you know what that was one of the drivers in us revamping our entire career site to be fully responsive. Because we wanted to make sure that we, you know, once you get somebody to click that link and you're driving them to your recruiting properties, what kind of experience are they gonna have? You know, are they gonna get to a, a non mobile optimized site where they're gonna have to pinch and scroll and you know, they're gonna bounce. They're not gonna stay. And so I think 
as you're looking at what your strategy needs to be for 2014, you have to have a social layer, but you really have to have a multi uh, a mobile layer as well because those things really go hand in hand. Yeah, thanks for the extra color there. <clears throat> and I think the mobile piece is going to be pretty much behind or the backdrop for everything you do because what you don't want to do is spend all that internal work mending fences between departments as a talent acquisition department do the employment brand exercise get the approval to put all the content on the social network and then have somebody come and have it not be mobile optimized or not be a great experience for them there's so much internal effort to get the social thing approved if you have legal battles or social policy battles even to have employees potentially help with the uh, sharing of the jobs that you really want to make it a great experience when you get there so so the third trend and you could debate this all you want, um, but I think it's pretty safe to say Facebook is merging professional and personal. So some people specifically still want to separate those, but I think the business world and the HR world has kind of reluctantly said, you know what, during the recession, everyone was communicating on Facebook and telling everybody that they needed help getting work that the employers found out that that's where the communication was happening you started to see people strategically use Facebook. So we have some companies that have multiple geographic pages, so they, they literally have a page for you know, specific geographies for that brand in that country, or it could be that business unit, that vertical. And now you have Facebook kind of waking up and realizing, wow, this thing is real, LinkedIn's making money, it's being successful, uh, and, it, and we have more people than just the professional crowd. I mean, Facebook reaches almost everybody from truckers to nurses uh, to college students. So you have a professional skills section that they've added. Um, they've also added work and industry categories to the Facebook targeting, and you can see example over here of the profile prompt, you know, where have you worked? So they're asking for life events. And pretty much, you know, one of the life events is if you, know, if you get married, if you have a, con a child, you know, when you change your job, if you move to a different city, these are life events, and one of them tends to be, you know, career-related. So here's, here's an interesting example. This is a, a little, literally a cut and paste. It um, uh, says, hey, I'm a, I'm a physiotherapist with a master's degree, and my husband's a surgeon. We both use Facebook and happen to be registered on LinkedIn. I can honestly say for most health professionals who are highly skilled, we'd be unlikely to use LinkedIn because it doesn't add value to their kind of their their day to day living, right? They're doing continuing education, they're reading medical reviews, but Facebook is where they have that social interaction. So this person's saying, I rarely, you know, look at LinkedIn and last week uh, two colleagues via Facebook let them know a job opportunity, asked them, you know, do they know any, any other people that the standard recruiter line is, hey, I saw your profile, you look like a fit for the, the really hard position I'm trying to fill. Do you know anybody else in the industry or, or having met you know some of the medical conferences? And so they're basically saying uh, someone should do a survey about the profile of the average Facebook user because I suspect that it's higher. And what just came out recently was interesting is the people between the ages of 24 and 35, which is a, a huge worker segment of the population, on Facebook grew by 32% over the last two and a half years. And the, the next higher segment, which is 35 to 55, grew by 42%. So you have an older demographic. The average age as of last year, late last year, was 38 on Facebook. The per perception is that it's still this kind of college thing, right? And it certainly started out as a college social site. I mean, you had to have an e.edu address at one point to become a Facebook membership member. And now it, the doors are open. Obviously, you can't be too young, but you really see um, kind of a more professional view and usage of Facebook. And that's just, you know, <laughs> a surgeon and somebody with a master's degree basically saying, hey, this is a great place to find me. And, and I, my colleagues are seeing that as well. Um, so, so we think... Facebook is a great place to anchor your social strategy. LinkedIn's a closed door. You have to pay for it or use it for free as a, as a you know, non-paying uh, recruiter member. And then Twitter is turning out to be um, a, a pretty great resource as well for sharing job content and getting people back to either the mobile optimized page or whatever the landing page you want to create. So the, the, the fourth trend, um, and I think this is not a surprise, right? This is, this is video ads. So any video, whether it be for interviewing, for uh, employer branding, a lot of the Facebook pages that work for builds for our clients, I think over 40% of them have some kind of video player that plays either on the mobile device or, or within the, the laptop experience. But this is something new. This is, you know, would you do an ad promotion on Facebook on either site that would automatically play in the news feed. So this is kind of cool. So what Facebook's doing is saying, hey, we're going to push the envelope a little bit. We're going to allow people to do a video ad versus just posting a story or 
talking about the great philanthropy efforts for the employees. And so this video ad for recruiting is kind of one of those not sure if it's going to stick, right? Are people going to actually advertise the video versus just have it available to somebody researching the company on either a page or a third party's website about careers? So we're not sure about this one yet, but it's a very interesting thing. What, what Facebook's seeing and what we're hearing people react to is content win. So if you have a visual job or a picture of somebody happy doing the job or a video, it's just more compelling. You're going to get 36% more clicks. You're going to get 46% more people commenting, sharing, and liking it. And that's what social is all about, is they're talking about you because you just put a video on there that's cool and goes viral, whether it's a cat video or a career video. It, if, it's, if it's fun and it's engaging, you know, people are going to react to that and do more with it. So those are, those are just kind of the, a quick and dirty on the, on the four kind of trends that may or may not be um, uh, something that's new to you. Um, and, and we're going to dive a little deeper into how do you build a strategy versus just use, um, you know, the surfboard to, to ride the wave of some of these trends, right? How do you get a little bit more serious? So um, if you want to talk just about social networks and Facebook real quick, 83% of the time spent on no social networks is on Facebook. So that means every other social network is competing for 17% of everyone's time. And it could be that it's on Instagram or Pinterest or you know, whatever social network that is your, you know, where you get the most value. It might not be a career-oriented um, social network. But this just tells you that it's close to a monopoly. Facebook globally is incredibly strong in almost every market except for China. And then the time spent on the network is incredibly um, you know, engaging. You know, it, it, no, nobody else has numbers even remotely close to this. And then the network of the user is, is pretty large. I mean, you're talking about a 31,000 person reach, uh, two people away from you. So it, it's a pretty big social footprint for a lot of the people using Facebook. So you want to find people who are interested in the same type of industry, same type of bond with your employees, or your company or your culture. And this is what's been really surprising to me. And my, I had a long time uh, career with a, with, a, with a job board before I came over to work for. The cultural information and the information about the company via Facebook or the Facebook company page, it doesn't even have to be a Facebook career page, is incredibly strong and incredibly informative to the point where people who go to the company career page and then go to their company Facebook page, they spend more time and they learn more about the the company to the Facebook page than they do the actual career page. And I, I can guarantee you they're spending more money to build a great career page on the company website than they are spending you know, a really robust Facebook uh, page with that content, although there is some money shifting to those. So these three things, the, the bond of your employees, your company, and your culture um, you know, are, are very strong. So the example here is to have it you know, be similar. right? The, the brand that you have, whether it's your colors or your graphics or your, um, you know, the resonating message, if you will, you know, have it synced with your HES. Have it look similar. So here's Gap, you know, the back to blue message. Um, the the we're hiring box you see highlighted there is is where the application would come up, and this could be mobile as well as for laptop. It looks and feels, you know, like Facebook while I'm still on here. The mobile version has nothing to do with Facebook. There's a video you can play. I can, sh I can share jobs. Um, it prompted me to where I worked um, so I can get more information if I don't have my work profile. All these little things just make the experience a little bit better. And then, of course, the Facebook wall is where the company then would put up content about, you know, how great it is to work there, um, some of the great efforts uh, that, that gaps up to, whether it be giving back or recycling or, you know, taking the, the clothes you know, manufacturing process more seriously, whatever their, you know, public face to the market is. And then you can actually reach people that have an affili affiliation with your company and target them to tell you about the message. So here's a Vista print ad on a mobile phone saying we're looking for a director of global communications and um, how it would look if it was on uh, the news feed or the desktop. So you can do the classic ads, which are the one ads you've probably seen if you use Facebook on the right-hand side. You can also uh, now get in somebody's direct news feed. And those ads are producing very good results. People are promoting kind of three main things. They're promoting a single job, a list of jobs. So I can say, hey, I'm looking for 
program managers, you know, in these three offices, and then the same job title will come up, and so I don't have to just show one job to a candidate that clicks on the ad. I can show a group of jobs or a group of jobs in geography, and they're building fan, fans, so they're trying to get more people to like the page, or they're doing physical hiring event promotions. It just depends on what it is. So not only are they getting more information from the profiles uh, from a Facebook perspective, they're hiring program managers to do more recruiting research uh, to turn around so we can, you know, have ads pull better than before. Another really important thing that's happened, and I bet most of the people on the phone are aware of this, is you can now search anybody on Facebook that has any data public on those fields. So it's called graph search, and basically the new search bar at the top used to be only kind of Facebook kind of keywords or page names that, that brought up matches for a page or, or a person. Now they've gone another step further, and they said, hey, you can actually search for anybody. It's mostly US and English that's working um, right now, and I can just type in sales executive. I can type in sales executive that works, you know, at Google or Diago or, you know, whatever the, the, the company is. And that is now allowing you to turn Facebook into a resume database, which is pretty powerful. So this is something that's, um, you know, getting better and the matching um, is only as good as the public data. But if people have their education, their job title, or their employer present, bam, you can catch them uh, via graph search. And then this all kind of leads to kind of the last piece of the puzzle is if you can brand yourself and if you can target people in ads, if you can search in the resume database, then you can obviously refer. And so this is where the job sharing comes in. So as you know, an anchor of your social strategy, if you want to choose Facebook, our tool and others as well, um, probably pretty well known that you know some ATSs are getting into this space too, I can now push my job to the Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook pages, as well as the corporate Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter pages from the same engine. So if you know anything about, say, Deliverit or Hootsuite, just think about those things, but specifically for jobs. Um, so that's my Facebook coverage. I'm going to cover a couple other social networks here. Lars, again, I want you to, to chime in if you want and, and chat a little bit about um, your experience with Facebook and where you think it's headed, and, and if you want to add some color to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a uh, a sorcerer by trade. I see you know Twitter lighting up right now with uh, sorcerers who want to uh, marry Facebook graph search if they were a man. Uh, you know, I think the you, you can't deny the volume of people that are on Facebook. There was also some comments about you know just because there's that volume of traffic on Facebook doesn't necessarily mean that they all want to mix business and pleasure. I, I think that's a valid point. Um, the reality is recruiters, we have to look at talent pools and where we can get access to people. Um, and I think as Facebook continues to evolve, that I think you know, LinkedIn as a platform, people know if you're there, you're going to be contacted by recruiters. Um, Facebook and even Twitter, I think people are starting to get more comfortable with the idea that they're likely to be contacted. Because the reality is, sorcerers have gotten a lot more sophisticated and with the prevalence of social media and all these different digital platforms, you know, people are just, they're accessible. And whether you get contacted through Facebook, GitHub, whatever, you know, you, you're going to be, if, you, if you're visible on these platforms, then your contact info is going to be accessible. Ultimately, you're going to be recruited. Um, so I think that I, I still look at Facebook, again, probably because I'm not a, a sourcer by trade. I look at Facebook more as a branding platform. Um, I think there's huge potential there, and uh, I think one of the things that makes Facebook somewhat unique, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit when we get the case study, you know, a lot of corporate recruiters, they, you know, they may not have the funds to create a super sexy career site. Uh, they may not have the resources and time, and frankly, they, they may not have the time to invest in that. But Facebook, you can create a career-focused page on Facebook and just spend a little bit of time a week nurturing that and really get huge dividends and engagement from that platform. So I always look at kind of scrappy, low-cost, you know, MacGyver-esque tools that recruiting leaders can use. And I think, you know, the Facebook corporate pages specifically that are aimed around careers are a huge, you know, low-cost way to make an impact in social recruiting. Great. Thank you, Lars. Appreciate um, the additional information there. Um, Okay, so, so LinkedIn. I think most of the people, I think the number was 93% of the companies in America have either used LinkedIn or have, you know, sourced people from LinkedIn. So it's, it's a pretty known solution. Um, 
what people probably don't realize is, is the reach of LinkedIn is pretty pretty deep. Um, they've kind of moved into business pages. I like to say that LinkedIn is becoming more like Facebook, where you can follow people and like stuff now. And then Facebook is slowly trying to, for their professional side, become more like LinkedIn and, and learn from each other. So they're competitive at some level. Um, on the professional side, there's there's potentially a lot of overlap, right? You know, you can source people through Facebook now and then say, hey, do they have a LinkedIn profile? We're finding that the people using Graph Search, um, either through our tool or just naturally, are actually finding people that are on LinkedIn, and that's been beneficial for them. Um, but you have the 200, you know, nearly 260 million users. There's a runway for LinkedIn to be a lot more successful in Europe, so we're seeing some case studies of LinkedIn being more successful there. And they're getting better with the advertising. So not only can you reach um, professionals and or um, you know, advertise to them. It's just a better way to network um, for the white collar or the professional worker. I think LinkedIn's uh, trying to get down to the college level as well. Um, but there has to be a value for you to belong to LinkedIn and to use LinkedIn. And if you jump on there, like, like my brother's a construction site manager, and he jumped on LinkedIn, and he got flooded with people who were like, hey, welcome, you know, you know, do you want a, another job in San Diego or whatever? And he jumped right back off. He goes, that's crazy. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm happily employed. I'm not going to go anywhere. And I guess I can do that when I'm ready or move, move there. And I think the secret is to understand that kind of that user. So leverage LinkedIn to find specific candidates with specific professional backgrounds. Um, and so you can you can a sniper fire, right? LinkedIn's great. Um, it's a little, little pricey compared to some of the MacGyver versions I think that uh, Lars was alluding to, but they do a great job and it's kind of a known entity. So I think it is a social network. Some people want to say it's turned into more of a job posting and a uh, resume database sourcing kind of solution, but I still think there's a, a huge social network component to it and I think it's raising, you know, the level of innovation and technology for everyone and again uh, the global innovation I think is where I think we're going to see LinkedIn kind of do a little bit more um, kind of growth uh, on their side and then you know our solution allows you to cross post to LinkedIn so you can take your job you can um, automate it or you can control it and say I'm going to post to LinkedIn at three o'clock on a Thursday and I'm going to put my um, materials handler job up from Oracle or put my Avis budget job up for a, a part-time driver in Kentucky so you can see examples of how you can job share the logo shows up there the link goes back to a mobily optimized page um, and then you, you really, you know, you have another kind of place to tell people about your company and strengthen the employer brand. So it plays a really big part there. Again, I think your content can, you know, really be king if you want to post a picture um, or, you know, the, a blog link to talk about how you're an expert in, in your field and, and stay in front of the candidate pools that Lars is talking about that are so important. Recruiters make their money by living the life of the people they recruit and so getting into those associations and those groups and that's a huge part of LinkedIn as well so if you're not playing around in the groups and posting on a regular basis to become kind of what you know a trusted advisor or a trusted person in that industry through tweeting or, or posting to LinkedIn um, strongly encourage that as well and you really can you know, with LinkedIn Recruiter, if you pay, uh, get some filtered searches for passive professionals. So it's a great resource, obviously, you know, one of the best databases in the world, uh, and more and more people are obviously being asked to go on to it, and if they don't have a bad experience, they typically stay, uh, and then it's a way for you to then pull people who are potentially passive passive employees. Um, and next and next will be Twitter. So Twitter has kind of become the information network. I got stuck, I got kind of, you know, stuck reading Twitter feeds. Um, years ago on my Blackberry when I used to travel in planes all the time. So they, they, they'd source enough Twitter feeds that I'd sit there in the plane and read through them all. I couldn't link to the pages, but I got, you know, a lot of my information through Twitter, and I still do. Um, and it's really kind of matured. You know, Twitter now allows you to do ads. So, you know, part of my ads team that I manage here at work for, we do Twitter ads now, you know, sponsored tweets, if you will. We also do the Facebook ads, you know, and, and other, other advertising as well. So. Twitter in just four or five short months and obviously they've gone public and so they've really ramped up some of their resources now you know has just more cachet I guess and, and more real benefit than just a celebrity telling you uh, what they did on Friday night right and then there's plenty of that but I think most news outlets most city governments most employers most people who are caring um, about an industry or a charity t Twitter is a great way to get information you know, and then 8 million Americans really say that that's how they found their job. So through information that came out in a tweet that was shared or retweeted, um, and it's becoming a resource that's um, you know, pretty valuable to a lot of people. You can leverage Twitter to find candidates. 
you can um, you know, obviously use hashtags and you can follow tweets on any t any topic so the educational the world of education is being changed by this um, and that leads to obviously the world of jobs and careers um, and that as we create more verticals for Twitter as we create more uh, industry experts watching and tweeting information you can't go or listen to a conference or even in this case the webinar we're doing right now without somebody saying hey great stat I just heard you know uh, at this conference or the industry pundits or even a Goldman Sachs you know <laughs> venture capitals to we'll be talking about a new technology this is where people are getting the information and we're such a fast-paced world right now that I'm getting the information quicker and more rapidly and Twitter is just a great way to say here's a highlight Here's the full article if you want to click on the link. Here's the hashtag if you want to follow the whole conversation. So it's really, I think, also being accepted as well. So it's kind of an employer brand play. Um, and, and Lars will talk about a little bit more about this in depth with, with his experience. So you can see the PepsiCo jobs, the Disney jobs page here. And then you get all the tweets. So you have to be careful. I wouldn't tweet just job opportunities all the time. Right? It's got to be a, a kind of a, a hybrid of great content about the company, maybe about what it's like to work there or the culture of, of work. And then you've got to um, pepper in uh, a few job opportunities as well. There's got to be value in me continuing to get content or else I'm going to you know, not follow that tweet source anymore. And then you really can source anyone anywhere. So it's kind of a, a, a new form of cold calling, if you will, with the hashtags, images, and the search. So if you haven't seen Twitter cards, they're very obvious, right? It's a big picture with, with information that looks just like this uh, NPR example on the page here. And this is where you start to see, huh, this is changing things. This is a story about a great job at NPR, which I listen to every day and, you know, I ride to work wherever you live or, um, you know, whatever the, the source you hear NPR on. Now I'm, I'm interested because that picture is compelling that they're, you know, deciding what article to release, and I could be part of the uh, network engineering team that, that, that supports that technology. That's pretty cool. That changes things versus just, just an ad via a text to, to another source. So that's Twitter. I, I covered those uh, last two very quickly. Um, we are seeing Google+, a little bit of Pinterest, but it's heavy female and heavy visual. And Instagram, kind of still a teenager thing, or if you're you know, just out of college, you're still using Instagram to, to mo more socialize. I don't think there's a professional version of these that's tangible yet. And Lars, you can chime in on this as well. But I think Google Plus is probably the next one to get people's attention. Pinterest, if you want to do info, you know, graphics, it's awesome. I, I have a bunch of Pinterest channels and, and go get content about the industry, but I haven't seen a lot of career-related um, success around that. And the Instagram is owned by Facebook, so um, all the stuff that Facebook's going to learn about within recruiting can potentially be passed down to Instagram. And I believe Instagram's going to launch the ability to advertise very soon to, to be more a little bit more profitable. But again, they're owned by Facebook, so Facebook's making money. I don't know that they have to rush recruiting or advertising into the Instagram bucket, um, but that's probably coming down the line. So uh, thank you for listening to my part of the presentation around the trends and kind of the big three social networks. Uh, let's get a little deeper. We're going to turn over to Lars, uh, who's, who has been around the block, and let him talk about what he's done to get the recruiting right uh, using these tools. I always get a little uneasy when my uh, intro starts with that I've been around the block. So hey, thanks for that, <laughs> Um You know, let me uh, let me open by just recommending that all of you invest eighty percent of your recruiting budget in Pinterest. That's the future. Get on it. Um, okay, now that we've got some levity uh, out of the way, let me let me jump into a little bit of uh, a few different channels that um, that have worked for us. So um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I spent the last three years running recruiting and innovation for NPR in Washington, D.C. Um, I recently left to launch my own firm, Amplify Talent, but uh, a lot of what I'm going to be walking you through now is pretty much a case study with some stats on what, how, and, and kind of where and why uh, we built our digital recruiting and social recruiting strategy at NPR. So um, getting started, uh, really for us, you know, NPR, for those of you uh, that don't know, is a, is a nonprofit organization. That means that we are quite light in terms of resources. Uh, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, it was myself. I had a senior recruiter and a recruiting coordinator. And so I was very hands-on in, in recruiting and also developing this entire social recruiting strategy. Um, we had some unique challenges because while we were a nonprofit, almost all of our competitors were you know, not just for profit, but in many cases, blue chip for profit. So in, in media and news while we're recruiting journalists, we're up against the New York Times and Washington Post and CNN and BBC and all these other organizations 
um, in technology, which was a big area, a growth area for NPR, we were up against you know Google and Amazon and Facebook and, and all these other you know well-known, well-established brands in the technology space. So we really kind of looking at that set out to say, okay, we were way under-resourced. Um, we're competing against groups with much more resources and budget than we have. You know, what can we do to level the playing field? And so for us, that's really where social recruiting came in to be at the forefront of our strategy. So kind of looking here, you know, we, we had a really strong consumer brand, and that was certainly an advantage for us in building our employer brand. Um, and we also wanted to take a brand ambassador strategy, and that was both internal getting our employees to really get behind social recruiting, uh, and also external, making sure that we got really tight in things like candidate experience. So everybody we brought in had an opportunity to go back to their respective um, fields and talk about their experience interviewing at NPR and the kind of talent that we have. So getting into, um, you know, again, we are a media company, so this stat highlights just some of the uh, follower stats we have on various channels. Um, you know, the interesting thing, being a media company, I think they have at least 15 different Tumblr accounts. That, uh, those stats are actually from the main NPR Tumblr account, um, but there are at least 15, and we're adding more uh, every week. You know, NPR is definitely a very social media, uh, you know, focused organization that's always looking at new ways to be able to tell stories to our listeners and our followers. Um, so a lot of these stats are around the core channels in these different uh, platforms, but there are sub-channels. We've got, you know, do excuse me, dozens of different Twitter accounts as well. So, uh, but this just kind of gives you a sense of the scale. Um, jumping into some of the channels. So, you know, this is, this quote in this story is something that I, I like to kind of illuminate why social is so important. And this actually ties together a couple different campaigns uh, that we used at NPR. So um, this excerpt is from a story the Washington Post did on NPR's use of social media and recruiting last year. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to interview somebody that we had hired through social media. And that's the person listed there, Teresa Gorman. And so you know, she actually connected with a couple different social recruiting campaigns that we had launched. Um, she wasn't looking for a job. She'd interned with NPR years ago. Uh, but she followed a hashtag that we created called PubJobs, and that's a collaborative recruiting hashtag that we created with a variety of other uh, public media organizations to help raise the profile for all public media jobs. So she saw a job that we had posted there. Um, that got her interest. You know, she wasn't looking for a job, so she wasn't on career sites. You know, she wasn't on job boards, um, but she was on Twitter, and she happened to catch the job that way. So that piqued her interest. Um, it had been a while since she was connected with NPR. So the next thing she did is she took a look at a employment branding hashtag campaign that we had developed called NPR Life. And NPR Life is really a collection of tweets and Facebook posts and Instagram um, shots from our employees really just sharing what the experience of working at NPR is like. And so that started to really give her a good feel for the culture and the environment. And she ended up applying, and she ended up accepting a job. But to me, you know, this quote really highlights why social is so important. Without Twitter, we wouldn't have hired her. She would not, you know, we would have had no way. She wasn't looking for a job. She wasn't going to job boards. She wasn't going to career sites. You know, we only happened to get her because she was on social media, and so were we. So um, that, I think, you know, talks to really a couple different aspects of, you know, Twitter specifically, which I want to jump into. You know, Twitter, I know CJ Dan said, you know, Twitter is uh, an emerging platform for social recruiting. At NPR, we actually put Twitter at the forefront of our social recruiting efforts. That was our first kind of foray, if you will, into social recruiting. And uh, by the time I transitioned out, Twitter was actually our number four source of hire. And that includes, you know, our number one were internal hires, number two was referrals, number three was career site, number four was Twitter. And, uh, and that's actually based on self-identification of hires. So I would, I would you know, assume that that number could actually be a little bit higher. But Twitter for us, you know, CJ raised a great point. Uh, and for those of you that are listening that are building kind of corporate recruiting accounts on Twitter, you know, there's a few advantages that I think Twitter provides over other platforms. Um, for one, it's an open platform. So with Facebook and LinkedIn, they both have their own advantages, but you have to be following that organization or friends with somebody who's following that organization to actually see that job, to see that content. With Twitter, you have access to everyone. And you can deploy 
hashtags and different methods to get your content in front of people who don't necessarily even follow your organization. So it, I think, allows you, you know, Facebook purely based on the number of users, you know, that's obviously a much bigger population, but I think Twitter, at least where we recruited, which was primarily media and technology, the people we were trying to recruit had a presence on Twitter for the most part. So it was a really rich talent pool for us to tap into. Um, another point that CJ raised that I want to just underscore is, you know, if you're creating a corporate recruiting account on Twitter and all you're doing is sharing jobs, you know, you basically have a, you know, quasi-social extension of your job board, but that's about it. People aren't going to really pay much attention to that unless they are, they're proactively seeking out jobs at your organization. You know, at, with NPR Jobs, we were really deliberate about every piece of content fitting into one of four categories. Sharing jobs, which by design was the smallest piece of content, um, providing, you know, building our employer brand and providing an inside look at life at NPR, and that was primarily for the NPR Life campaign. Um, promoting other jobs in public media, and that was primarily through the Pub Jobs campaign. Um, and then giving back to the community, providing job search and career tips uh, and things like that, useful articles. The, the, the key with a strong social recruiting account, in my opinion, is providing value to your followers. It's not just about jobs. Provide them with things that are interesting. They're, and they're not even necessarily only about your company. They can be about the industry. They can be trends that, uh, that you think your audience will find interesting. So that's the kind of stuff that makes your account you know, desirable and ultimately sticky. It gets people to share your content. The more people are sharing your content, the more people can discover your account, the more people will follow your account. And that's really what I think allowed us to grow over the period of you know, a little over two years from zero to 20,000 plus followers because we had a, a really focused approach on making sure that the number one priority of NPR jobs was providing value to our followers. Um, jumping into uh, a few other areas, I mean, when you're using Twitter, you know, hashtags are a great way to spread your content um, to different areas. So this just highlights a few of those campaigns that I mentioned before. Um, NPR Life, you give some examples of the tweets themselves. Um, so that's a really valuable way, especially as you're just starting to build an audience to get the content that you're creating and ultimately get awareness for your account in front of new audiences. Um, LinkedIn, you're all recruiters. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. Uh, imagine you're all pretty familiar with LinkedIn. You know, the one thing that I would say about LinkedIn is, uh, especially for those of you that are in corporate recruiting roles, you have a lot of flexibility around uh, developing content and doing corporate status updates on LinkedIn. And that actually, LinkedIn named the NPR page one of the top pages of 2013. I think that was in large part because we had a very uh, focused approach around sharing content. Um, every day we posted at least one status update on the LinkedIn page. And again, very you know, infrequently was it jobs. Um, and it wasn't even all about NPR. It was about things that we, you know, we learned over time that our audience is interested in. So again, it's, it's that whole theme of providing value. Um, Facebook, you know, obviously we're talking a lot about Facebook. Um, at, at NPR, you know, there are multiple Facebook channels. We have our core, you know, facebook.com slash NPR, which is purely an editorial channel. And then we have the This is NPR page, which is really more of a, a corporate branding page. Uh, we do use Workfor for our embedded job board. We have that hooked into each. Um, and you can see, you know, this, this channel has ultimately led to Facebook being our number seven source of um, applicants and our number nine source of hire. And I think when you look at tools like Workflow, what made this such a valuable resource for us is getting into you know, leveraging existing networks to drive referrals. So for us, again, I mentioned our recruiting team was really lean. The job, the social sharing capabilities of Workflow was really a, a huge help because essentially you know, I could automate and queue up the NPR jobs account, uh, again, because again, we use Twitter so heavily. I could queue that up through the Workflow job sharing app to share three jobs a week. You know, that was our frequency because we deliberately wanted to keep it low. But that drove tons of engagement. As you can see, 70% of the job views on our career site were driven from the social sharing feature. And that really goes back, I think, to trend number two we talked about earlier in the presentation around going, going mobile. Because again, if we're driving this traffic to 
at a site that's not mobile optimized, they're going to drop off. They're not going to follow through. And ultimately, you want to get their attention, but you want them to follow through all the way to the apply um, section. So CJ, let me kick it back over to you for a minute, because I know that you were uh, really instrumental in helping us get that part of the, uh, the social sharing fine tuned. So do you want to shed any more light on that? Sure. And I think it's a good point, Lars. Um, not only um, you know, is some of the traffic driven from social job sharing, but it also tends to be that mobile traffic we're talking about. So when I first joined, we really had two products. So we had the Facebook page, and then we had basically the ability to advertise. And so we'd always go to each client and say, well, here's the page. And then, you know, to get traffic or to build a fan base, you have to advertise and get more fans. So we'd say, we'd show, you know, your picture, Lars, and say, Lars likes this page. You know, you're, the, you're his friend. Would you like to learn more about NPR jobs as well? And then that would get, you know, you'd spend roughly a dollar, and you'd get, you know, 50% return. So for every dollar you spent, you'd get, you know, half a fan, right? So if you spend $2,000, you get 1,000 fans. And that was a kind of a rule of thumb. Then we leveraged a social job sharing tool, and in, in this case, it's, it's a little higher than normal, but it's about 40 to 50 percent of everybody that has, you know, our, our page up. The social job sharing admin license comes with the page, and then if you want to get more licenses from more recruiters, um, we can do that, or we can sell you kind of free automated licenses, and then we can pick the jobs for the recruiter. Most recruiters and sourcers want to um, you know, have more control over that, and that's been a huge piece of not only just the social job sharing views, like you mentioned, but then the mobile traffic, it comes along with it, and it presses the mobile conversation a little deeper into the, uh, the, the HR team's you know, next steps as well. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and I think you know, we, we talk a lot about social. You have more tools at your disposal than just social. So, you know, career sites are another really valuable piece. That is something that I know takes money, it takes time. You may not have the opportunity to, you know, do a full overhaul. My recommendation, if you can do anything at all with your career site, make it mobile optimized. Make that career site responsive. Even if you can't, you know, if you have grand ambitions of, you know, sexy employee videos and really cool, you know, interactive functionality. All, all those things are great if you have a huge budget. Most of you don't. So if you can do one thing with your career site, make it responsive, make it mobile optimized. Because again, you want that end-to-end -end mobile experience for candidates to be there. Um, looking at other opportunities too, I mean, blogs are another great resource. And this is something, you know, just to kind of give a personal anecdote at, uh, at NPR, it took me probably two and a half years to finally be in a position where our digital team had the resources to revamp the career site. Um, I wanted to do that for a long time before they had the bandwidth to do it. One of the things I wanted to do is create a blog in that as well. And they ultimately, you know, because again we're a media company, the blog format was set up in a way that it took a lot of customization um, to be able to get that set up and they didn't have the resources to do that. And I really wanted to st start creating longer form content for the audience that we're building. So I went to Tumblr, and I just created mprlife.tumblr.com. And that, again, Tumblr is free. There's no barriers to entry. You can easily get up. And so I think another valuable piece for places like Tumblr come into play is you may be in an organization that is uh, heavily uh, you know, vetted from a content perspective. Maybe you work for a conservative organization. And the idea of you creating a corporate blog uh, from an HR perspective, is is terrifying to them, and they wanna they wanna review every piece of content and every little bit of things that that come out from you. Go to Tumblr, you know, just start something small that you can scale. You can build a following there. You can get people engaged around the content there, and it may be a way for you know those of you that are in environments where you know they're really good at telling you no to to circumvent a little bit of that no. So. Um, just a, a little, a little approach that I think uh, I think can go a long way. Um, another thing to consider outside of just social is job descriptions. You know, we all work with job descriptions every day, and most job descriptions suck. Most job descriptions are compliance-driven. They're really just focused around you know a laundry list of likely unrealistic or inflated qualifications and uh, you know uh, responsibilities that are completely uninspiring. They don't have to be. You, you can look at, when you're looking at creating a strong employer brand for your organization and drawing the type of creative, engaging talent that is probably passive and, and you know, you're really going to have to have a well-crafted job description to lure them in, look at doing a job description differently. Maybe it's a video job description. 
Um, maybe it's an infographic. You know, the, the example here is an infographic job description that I played around with for a recruiting manager position that I was hiring at NPR back in the day. But you don't have to limit yourself to purely text. And it's actually a great way to differentiate yourself from um, most of your competitors out there. So, you know, when you have, these are just some examples of tweets, when you have an engaged um, population, especially on Twitter, you really have an opportunity to drive engagement and ultimately amplify jobs. But again, if your Twitter approach is really just sharing jobs, you're not going to have that engagement and you're going to have much less traffic when it comes to actually amplifying those jobs. Give value to them. Then when you need them and you share a job, they're going to be much more likely to share it. Just like the general rule of social media, right? before you ask. Don't just shove jobs down people's throat because they're going to tune out if they're not actively looking for a job right at that moment. And when you really need them to share that hot job with their network, you've already lost them. They're tuned out. So, you know, this is something I want to just take a, a minute on. And this is really what I consider to be the, the three-phase social recruiting roadmap. And I think for those of you that are really looking to bring social to your organization, you know, this is more or less kind of what you can expect from a, a time investment um, standpoint. So really, the, the first three months, um, I consider that to be the design phase. You're, you're developing your strategy. You're figuring out who your internal stakeholders are. You're working to gain support with them. Um, you're aligning yourself with marketing and branding and communication and kind of who are the social media stakeholders within your organization. You really need to invest in those relationships because you're going to need them. Um, and then you're starting to launch channels. You know, once you've done that, now you're executing. So the remainder of that year, you're refining your content strategy. You know, you've got to use tools to measure the, you know, the impact of your posts, the engagement levels, retweets, shares, likes, you know, all of those things. And many tools like Facebook and LinkedIn actually have embedded uh, analytics tools directly within the platforms so you can get a real-time sense of engagement levels around each piece of content. Um, but you really want to refine that. You're getting to know your audience. You're getting to know the kind of content that's going to resonate with them. So really, that next period is, is trial and error. You're experimenting. You're piloting. Uh, you're looking at new channels. A really important thing during this stage is that last bullet. Promote wins internally. You've got to be comfortable managing up to be successful in building a social recruiting roadmap. Because a lot of times, you might be working with executives or a CHRO that you know, they, they may not know what you're doing. Uh, and you know, maybe they're a little skeptical of what you're doing. So if you're able to share those wins with them, then that really helps them get on board and understand the value of what these, you know, what these campaigns that you're doing bring. Um, and then really when you, once you get beyond that first year stage, it's, it's refinement. So you're continually looking at metrics. Um, you're getting a better sense of source of hire now. So you get to know where your candidates and your hires are coming from. You're expanding channels. Hopefully you're pulling more people in to help with the content. Uh, and then, again, you're continually measuring, refining, and adjusting. And um, you know, the last piece I wanted to share here is what I call the social recruiting funnel. And really, this is a breakdown of you know, your efforts specifically around social media and where that ultimately drives the candidate. So you know, discovery, this is using these channels to get in front of people. Let, you know, let them know you exist. You know, this is really the, you know, you, they see a tweet in their stream and say, oh, you know what, I didn't know, you know, Acme Jobs was on Twitter. You know, I have no interest in Acme Jobs, but hey, that's great, they're there. You know, now you start working them down that funnel a little bit. Now you're branding. Now they're starting to see more content. Now it's, now they're finding that it's compelling content. They're becoming curious. Oh, I didn't know that, you know, Acme Company had those kind of jobs. That's kind of the stuff that I want to do. You know, hmm, maybe I should check that out. Then it's, it's joining them down further. Now you're getting into engagement. You know, you, you've successfully started engaging some of these brand advocates. You have people sharing your content. You're able to reach people that you wouldn't through traditional recruiting methods. And, and ultimately, you've taken them all the way down that funnel to the point where they're ready to apply. And, and that really is the, the ultimate goal of a lot of the social recruiting and employer branding efforts. It's taking them all the way through from discovery to actual application. And the last thing here is uh, really just kind of a recap, you know, key takeaways. Um, these are all things that uh, I, I think are, are important and really just highlight a lot of the things that we've already covered. So, you know, building relationships, selecting appropriate channels. Um, if you're working for a CHRO and they tell you to go out and establish a presence on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, 
you know, Vimeo, whatever, all at once, you know, just, just laugh. Pick a channel. You know, you're going to be resource constrained. What, what I would always recommend to people is if there's one channel that you're intimately familiar with personally, maybe it's Twitter, maybe it's Facebook, whatever it is, start there. You know that channel. Don't jump into a, a new, you know, emerging social network that you know nothing about and, you know, expect to, to pay dividends there quickly, especially when you're just starting to build that social recruiting strategy approach within your organization. If you pick something you know, chances are you're much more likely to be successful and actually uh, building that out and, and ultimately able to scale from there. So with that, uh, let me just kind of end the, uh, the presentation deck on uh, contact info for uh, CJI. And uh, Matt, let me turn it over to you to see if we have any questions. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate it. And that was some awesome info. So thank you so much, you guys, for that. Um, one question uh, from Lisa Jones uh, came in on Twitter. Um, in terms of building uh, that, that argument and managing up, Lars, uh, and can you talk a little bit about uh, the best way of measuring ROI and how to present those wins internally? Yeah, so you know, I think the ultimate measure of successful social recruiting campaigns are hires. Um, but it's going to take you time to get there. Uh, it's definitely not something that you're going to be able to make a case around the hires that social is driven for you um, when you're just starting to build something out. So I would say, you know, if you need to, if, if you're starting with a skeptical manager, try to pull some data. There's lots of articles out there from places like Fast Company and Harvard Business Review and lots of, you know, kind of thought leadership posts on how social media has transformed and impacted recruiting. So if, if you need to start with that, to just say, look, this is where things are going, and I want to make sure that we are, you know, positioned in a strong place in the candidate marketplace. Maybe look at your competitors. If you know you're not, if if you're getting resistance internally to getting on Twitter or Facebook, look at what some of your competitors are doing. Maybe they're already there. You know, there's nothing like some competitive fear to motivate uh, people to adopt some innovation. So you know, spend some time in seeing those other companies that are in your your industry that are actually already using some of these channels and say, look, we don't want to be left behind here. Um, but I think ultimately you want to essentially, you know, once you've kind of proven that, you know, pick a channel and just track the stats and metrics. So, you know, with Twitter, there's a great tool called Crowd Booster. Unfortunately, it's not free uh, anymore, but it's a fairly light price. That will tell you the, you know, the amount of retweets, of shares, of follower growth um, for both Twitter and Facebook pages. So. That's something I use, and um, for Facebook and LinkedIn corporate pages, they have those analytics embedded right in there. So you can you can use examples and say, look, here's a job that we you know we tweeted out and it was shared you know five times, and it led to this person asking us about the job on Twitter. You know, so you know even those small wins when you're starting out, every win counts, and you know making sure that your boss, making sure the leadership within your organization understands the results. Uh, some of these things you're working on is really important. Great. And um, following up on that question, uh, yeah, I know that you had mentioned uh, tweet reach. Are there any other systems or tools that you can recommend for uh, for measuring uh, and monitoring um, the s social recruiting campaigns? Yeah, I mean, so I, I use uh, a handful at this point. Um, I use uh, Buffer is probably uh, my most recommended app in terms of scheduling posts. Um, that's a really valuable resource. Um, it's not free, but the cost is, is relatively reasonable, um, particularly for the value that it provides. And there's actually analytics built into that directly as well. Um, Crowd Booster is another that I mentioned. You know, Hootsuite has analytics capabilities. Um, that's actually free. You can pay to upgrade. Um, those are tools that I would definitely uh, recommend kind of out of the gates. Crowd Booster, um, Buffer, and uh, it's sweet. Okay, great. And um, I think that that really is bringing us uh, to the end of time uh, on this. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and conclude the webinar as we have a hard stop in one minute. CJ, Lars, appreciate uh, some great material, and thanks to everyone for listening in. We'll be sending you a copy of this recording as well as the slides of the presentation uh, sometime this afternoon. So thank you again uh, for attending, and we'll see you soon at Recruiting Blogs. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone.